for Lord. Overcome us with your presence. Change us with your presence this morning, God. Don't leave us the same as when we arrived here. When we came together for worship, we might have been tired, we might have been worn out, might have been frustrated or angry. But God, we know that you're the God that transforms. You're the God that renews and revives. You're going to set us apart. You're going to make us holy. And you do that because of your Holy Spirit in our lives. So we invite you, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Don't let us resist it. Let us be ready for it and prepared for it as we worship your name, as we take your name and, and, and lift it high this morning, Lord. We want to lift it high and honor it because that name is more powerful than anything else that we could possibly call on. It's more powerful than any other name in this world, more powerful than sin, more powerful than death, more powerful than disease or depression or anxiety. God, give us peace today because you are more powerful than all of that. We pray this in your holy, everlasting, and all-powerful name, Jesus. Amen.
we're so grateful to have been here in your presence. Lord, there's nothing quite like it. And God, as we hear your word this morning, I pray that you just do something deep in our hearts, in our soul. God, just continue the fire that you're already burning within us. We surrender our lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. It's been wonderful being together in this time of community. Here's a quick update for you on what's happening at Harvest this week. Good morning. My name is Caleb and I serve on the Dream Team. We are so glad that you are joining us in our online service here at Harvest today. We are honoring the commitment and recommendations of the CDC to help slow the spread of the COVID-19 virus, so we will have our online service again next week. There will also be no gathering of our youth service Wednesday night. We will continue to monitor our response to this pandemic and keep you informed. You can find these updates at harvestsf.org slash updates as well as on our social media platforms. During this time, our small groups are still running. We have options through technology to gather online, so reach out to your small group leader to find out how you can still stay connected. At this time, groups of 10 or fewer can still gather and we encourage you to do so. Harvest is also connecting with churches around our city to aid those in need. For those of you that feel comfortable and would like to serve in this capacity, please reach out to us. If you feel more comfortable giving financially so that we can continue to serve our city and our community, you can give online at harvestsf.org slash give, or you can text the word give to 605-250-3145 through the Tithely app. Finally, we are committed to praying for you. We are standing in faith and trusting God during this trying time. If you have any request, we would be honored to pray for you. There are a number of ways that you can send us your prayer request. You can email us at prayer at harvestsf.org, send a direct message to us through our Facebook or Instagram, or you can post right here as you watch online on YouTube. That's it for Harvest News. Our hope is that you stay healthy, strong, and faith-filled during this week. Good morning, Harvest Church. We're so glad that you're with us this morning, gathered around your computer or wherever you're at, watching us on your phone. Thank you for joining us this morning. If you're joining us for the first time uh, via uh, our online service, thank you uh, for being a part. We are excited that you're with us this morning. This is our second week kind of being quarantined, if you would. And so we just want to say thank you uh, for sharing in this time with us. Thank you for sharing in worship with us. And so I want to just encourage you this morning uh, with with a scripture, and the scripture. I know we're we're kind of in this process right now, where maybe you're sitting at home and you've been at home for a while because your job has kind of laid you off for a period of time or whatever it may be, and you're kind of thinking, "What in the world am I going to do?" I just want to tell you, first of all, everything is going to be okay, and we're going to make it through this. I read a scripture the other day, and it said, <clears throat> Philippians chapter four, verse nineteen says, "And my God." will meet all my needs, all your needs, according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And so I'm, I'm just taking comfort in the fact that God's going to meet every need I have. And I believe he's going to meet every need that you have. And so I just encourage you with that today. Today I am, uh, I am invited somebody to come and speak for, I actually was supposed to be out of town uh, I had planned a trip to be out of town a couple of months ago, and uh, I'd invited somebody to come and share. And so uh, I'm going to ask Pastor Bill Boyd, who is a great friend of uh, ours, as well as a part of our church here. He's pastored for many years, been a part of the kingdom building and strengthening and encouraging people. And so I know he has an encouraging word for all of us today. And so I'm going to just invite him to come share with us this morning, and we're excited to have him. So, Pastor Bill, will you come? Well, good morning. I want to share a message with you today that has been weighing heavily on my heart, 
and I have a lot of scriptures to go through here, so I'm going to jump right into this. Hopefully we can get you out of here in the next three hours or so. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really tell you you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The very first conversation that the devil had with human beings was about God himself. Not only that, but the very first conversation he had was about God's word. He asked Eve, did God really say? Could it be that Satan did this because he knew that in order to get rid of God's rule, he had to get rid of the authority of God's word? An interesting part of Satan's strategy is that he didn't really try to get rid of religion. The whole conversation here was about God. In fact, if you read further on your own time, you'll see that he even went so far as to tell Eve that she could be like God in verse 5 of that same chapter. Satan doesn't mind religion. You can go to church all day long if you want. But what he does mind is when you acknowledge God as ruler over your life. You can see this by a clever maneuver that Satan used when he talked with Eve. Prior to the conversation between the woman and the snake, the creator of the world and of the universe is referred to in scripture as Lord God. And I reference that, and it means ruler, absolute authority. Yet when Satan spoke with Eve, he said, God. He purposely left out the fundamental principle that God is the rightful king over this planet and over this earth. The issue in the garden was really about whose word would be final. Would it be Satan's or would it be the Lord God's? Let me ask you a question today, and I had to ask myself this. Is God Lord God of your life? Is he ruler, having absolute authority over every area of your life? Or will you just say that he is God and you live life your own way? Whenever you and I allow the devil to cause us to question the ultimate authority of God in our lives, what we've done is we jeopardize our influence in God's kingdom. And as a result, that's why so many Christians never really live out God's kingdom authority and his given plan for their life. Listen to these two passages. The first comes from 1 Timothy chapter 4, and it's verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit explicitly states that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the hypocrisy, hypocrisy of lies, which, who, of liars whose consciences are seared. And then the second one comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And I'm going to read these, and then I'll get into them a little bit later. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily upset or troubled, either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us alleging that the day of the Lord has come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. Again, it's Satan wanting to take over complete authority that is rightfully God's in our lives. Let me give you some example of some of the changes that I've seen over the years. I remember many a cold day standing on the roof 
of our house and turning the antenna, trying to get one of two channels that would come in. And it was either Kello Land or I don't even remember the other one, PBS or something. While my dad would holler out to somebody down below, that's good. And we would go down and a couple hours later he'd want to watch the wild, wild west and we'd have to turn the antenna again. Today, you can get thousands of channels in right through your own phone, through the internet. I remember watching the Beatles for the first time on our old black and white TV. And for some of those of you who are old enough, you can remember when you turned the old black and white TVs on, they didn't just come right on. It took a while for them to phase in. Well, Ed Sullivan had the Beatles on, and I had a sister whose walls were wallpapered with the Beatles. And I tried to execute myself that day, and I unplugged the television and almost lost my life. I remember having a party line. And for those of you who had a party line telephone, you knew that your ring was like one ring and two, one short and two longs. Everybody in the county could listen to your telephone calls. Today, in fact, I remember talking to my wife when I was in Japan, and you would have to say, hello, stop, how are you, stop. That's how we communicated back then. I learned how to type on a manual typewriter. Believe it or not, I type extremely fast, so I was one of the fast kids who got an electric typewriter. Then they came out with a newfangled jobby called an Olivetti. And an Olivetti had a screen that went across the top of it, and you could type an entire line without having to hit enter. That way you didn't have to go back with the white chalk thing and erase your mistakes. Today, we, ex we complain when our computers will only do 800 billion bits of information in a tenth of a second because they're too slow. I remember John F. Kennedy being assassinated and my mother standing in front of the television and crying and saying, how could things get any worse? Today we have congressmen who go behind our president's back or, or stand and call him names openly to the public. I remember going to a one-room country school for the first six years of my life and the, the number one recess activity that we had I shouldn't even tell you this, but I will. My pastor's going to reprimand me after this. But our number one recess was drowning gophers out and beating them with a bat. We played Annie I Over, Fox in the Den. We played all kinds of stuff outside. We were outside. Yet today you see the kids and they're in their rooms playing video games or watching TV. In high school, my brother Clem and I and two of our friends against our parents' wishes, went to a triple X-rated movie, drive-in movie. And today, you can see more skin on primetime TV than you could on that drive-in movie. I watch this stuff happening, and I think about back when every young guy in high school had a shotgun or a rifle in their car for shooting critters or just having fun. Today, if you get caught with a gun on your, in your car on school property, you're in trouble. Let's move that to the church. I can remember sitting in services back in the 80s when the power of the Holy Spirit was so strong, you didn't want to get up and leave. I can remember that when the doors were open, my wife and my kids were there. Sunday morning, you had Sunday morning service. Sunday evening, you had Sunday evening service, and the church was full. Today, we're lucky to get people to come to one service, let alone two. The pastor would preach a message that convicted people. At the end, the altar would be full. Today, our pastors have to apologize if they preach out against sin because they might offend somebody. In the old days, we're told that the kings uh, were, in fact, in our home group, we're studying a little bit on kings, and we're told that, that many of the kings did evil in the sight of the Lord. And one of the things that says that they did is they made their children pass through the fires of Moloch. 
And what that was, was they had a statue, and they would heat that statue up until it was red hot. And they would put a naked infant in the hands of that statue while they beat the drums so you couldn't hear the child screaming until the child was dead. Today, we have church leaders, along with our elected officials, applauding because we've signed legislation to allow babies to be killed up until they're, abor- uh, they're born. Second Peter 2 says that because of the unrighteousness that was around him, Lot's righteousness was vexed. And what that means is literally his righteousness was worn down. Part of my reasoning for my message this day is we've got to be so careful with what's going on around us that we don't allow our righteousness to be worn down and not realize what's going on in our own hearts. Proverbs 4.23, I love the God translation. It says, guard your heart more than anything else because the source of your life flows from it. Your heart here literally means the core of who you are. It's the core of your being. It's the reason you're willing to slam the table for different things. So Proverbs says, guard the core of your being with who you are, with everything you are, because out of that, you're going to act on the issues of life. Now, how does that pertain to these two passages that we started with earlier? First off, we read that the Spirit explicitly states that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. And the second one we read was that there's someone who's coming, who is going to deceive the entire world. And before Jesus comes, there's going to be this great falling away from the faith. It's I don't believe it's something that's just going to happen like that. I believe it's something like Lot. It's gradual, and we see it happening in the church over time, slowly but surely. Everywhere around us, we're inundated with these things to the point that we don't even recognize them anymore. Now, I want you to think about this for just a second, and hear me out before you judge me on this, okay? I I looked this up, and so far, the CDC has estimated based on a weekly estimate that influenza has at least ki- has killed at least 12,000 people from October 2019th to uh, February 1st of this year. And the number of deaths might be as high as 30,000. Now check this out. The CDC also estimates that up to 31 million Americans have caught the flu this season with anywhere between 210 and 370,000 people being hospitalized from the flu this season. On the flip side of that coin, just right at 70,000 people have been infected with this COVID-19 with approximately 1,000 deaths. Did you catch that? That's a fraction of what's going on with influenza A. Yet, whenever you see something like this, uh, let me back up. When have you ever seen something like this, at least I haven't in my lifetime, fueled by the media that people are in such a frenzy that you go to the grocery store and things are absolute, the shelves are empty? My wife and I were joking around the other day, and we thought, let's, let's check out the toilet paper aisle in Walmart. It was empty. <sighs> toilet paper. <laughs> the, the, the thing that blows me away is, okay, we're going to be quarantined in our house for two weeks. We're not going to get food. We're going to get toilet paper. <laughs> What's wrong with that picture? When have you ever seen the government takes such radical control of our lives in so short a period of time, and nobody is asking questions. I'm not saying that some of the things that they're doing are not right, 
But I'm hearing today that several states now have outlawed fishing and hiking and going on walks. We are so close to martial law in so many areas, and nobody is saying a thing. And if anybody does say something, they're a conspiracy, conspiracy theorist or they're just wacko. Now, I, I, I want to say this. If the whole world can be put into fear this easily, how easy is it going to be for this coming leader to buffoon people, to beguile them, and say, did God really say? Let, let, me, let me say this. I get it. It's Pastor Charlie and I have talked about it, and it's not something to be taken lightly. But I think that we as the church especially, where is our faith? When did we as a church stop referring to God as Lord God and trusting him? Not just in this area, folks, in every area of our lives. Listen to this story I read just recently. This man decided that he's going to go visit his friend, and his friend lives out in the country on a farm. As the man is driving, he's driving by this building, and he sees on this building all these bullseyes, and he looks, and what in the world? And he stops, and he goes up. Every one of those targets has one bullet hole right through the center of that target. He says, oh my goodness, how could anybody be so good? So he drives on down the road, and he comes to his friend, and he said, have you seen that building back there with all those targets on it? He said, somebody hit them perfectly. And his friend said, yeah, I did. He said, how did you learn to shoot that way? He said, I shot first and then I drew the target around it. I think that much of what we see right now is our society's approach to life. We do everything we can to fool ourselves and others into thinking that we're on target when in fact we're way off course. We attempt to camouflage our emptiness and our failures and we fill it with emptiness through religious activities. We learn to look and act and talk like Christians and oftentimes we're simply obscuring the fact that we're tragically off the mark. Me too. Ouch. I fully believe that we're in this time, the beginning of this time that the Bible is referring to called apostasy. A time when we no longer really take the teachings of the Bible for what they are. They're right out of God's mouth. I know this sounds harsh, but I, I think we've come to a point where Christians are so overtaught, but we're not applying the word in our lives. And you notice I'm using me too, we. So what do we do to ensure that we're guarding our hearts? What do we do to ensure that we're guarding the core of who we are so that we are truly the righteousness of Christ, so that we're truly allowing God to have full authority in our lives? Number one. Hear me when I say this. If you're sitting in a church and you never hear a mes message that convicts you, you need to run from that church and find a church where they're preaching the word of God. I, I guess I'm going to give a cheap call out to our church here because that's one of the reasons we attend here, because we hear the word here. Number two, you need to be a self-feeder. I'll tell you what, I love our pastors with all my heart, and I, I lay down my life for them. But I do not expect them to come to my house every day, knock on my door, and read scriptures to me any more than I would expect them to come and feed me Cheerios. Remember earlier when I said that Satan wants to eliminate the authority of God's word in our lives? 2 Timothy says, study to show yourself approved by God, a workman who is fit, rightly dividing the truth. 
Number three, as we move into these days ahead, let me encourage you. Uh, first off, I, I need to tell you that I'm the kind of person, and my wife will tell you, she, this is probably our biggest argument that we have in the home. I could be in my home all day long with nothing playing, just silent solitude. I love to be alone. It's just how I am. Home groups came up, and I fought being a part of home group because I like to be alone. We are a part of a home group, and I'm telling you folks, it's been one of the best things that's happened to me in the last five years of my life. We're drawn closer. We're with young people. They make us feel young, even though they call us fossils. We love it. Be a, get with people who are like-minded like yourself. Number four, Jeremiah 6.16 says, This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you'll find rest for your souls. Another translation says, this is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. Travel its path, and you'll find rest for your souls. Dodie and I were mentored by two older people. In fact, until he passed away, he was probably my best friend at 92. And these guys were so legalistic, you had to have gold on the pages of your Bible. It had to be King James. Women couldn't wear dresses. But at the same time, they gave us godly principles that we live by today. I'm telling you, you need to look at some of the older people and look at some of the ways of the church of the past and ask God, Lord, we need to get back. We need to get back. I'm not talking about going back and being religious. Remember I said Satan doesn't care about us being religious. I'm talking about making God Lord God in my life and in yours. As I close today, and I'm going to just have Justin come, I'd like to share, I shared this message with Dodie earlier. And she said, wow, that's kind of depressing. And the last thing I want to do is be depressing today. I want to be encouraging to you. Peter said, he said, for me to tell you these things is not negligent, but you need to hear them. I've had numerous dreams in the past year. In fact, I've had more dreams in the past year about the Lord returning than I have in the past five I've studied eschatology now for going on 34 years. In fact, that's how I got saved. The Lord Jesus visited me in my dreams one night with the end of days. The Bible calls it that great and terrible day. When Jesus returns, it's going to be a great day for some, and it's going to be a terrible day for others. Everywhere you look, Romans chapter 8 says that the earth is groaning, waiting for the redemption of the sons of man. Everywhere you look, the signs are around us. My hair is standing on end. Our God is coming for us soon. Jesus, the King of kings. Today, if he came, would you be ready? If you stepped through that door into eternity today, would you be ready? God is not asking you to be religious and walk around in a five-piece suit. He's asking you, make me Lord of your life. Let me pray with you today. Father, I pray for all who are watching this today. I thank you, Lord, that they're watching because you've given them a divine appointment today. I thank you, Lord, that they're watching because, God, you love them more than anything they could imagine. Folks, the Bible says that God loves us so much, he's actually jealous over us. God, I thank you that you love me that much, that you're that jealous for me. And I thank you 
that you love each one of these so much. Today, right where you're sitting, you don't have to do anything fancy. You don't have to be here. You're already hearing this message. So I just want to invite you this morning. Would you say, Lord Jesus, I realize you died on that cross for a purpose. And that purpose was to save me. Please forgive me of my sins. And would you come into my life and rule and reign over me from here on in. And God, I give you my heart from here on. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for the great word today. And I, I want to encourage you if, you, if you prayed that prayer, if you made Jesus the Lord of your life, um, take a moment and tell somebody about it. It doesn't have to be, it could be somebody right there where you're at. It, it may be that you can email me. You can email me. Just go to harvestsf.org and email me. Just tell me, hey, today I committed my life to Christ. And again, there's no work that has to be done. You don't have to come to a church. You don't have to give in an offering. It's just simply a free gift. Really, the heart of Harvest Church is that every person that every person on the planet comes to know the gracious gift that God gave us through Jesus. And that's our heart. We're not about religion. We're not about trying to put on something that we're not. We're not trying to be anything more than what God's called us to be. And today, we encourage you if you're part of Harvest Church, I want to encourage you to do a couple of things for me. Number one, I want you to continue to stay connected. Call somebody, email somebody, um, reach out, text someone. Stay connected. If you're doing small groups and you're a part of a small group, a lot of our small groups have gone to online and doing Zoom and different things. Our youth, if you're part of the youth group, connect to the youth group. They're doing something every week. And so I would, I would encourage you to Stay connected. The second thing I want to encourage you to do is continue to give. We are continuing to bless our city and do things for people and continue to spread the word and, and the gospel. And next week, we're going to continue to do the same thing right here. And the update is, is that we won't have corporate gathering next week. We'll have, again, live streaming right from here to your home. And so... I uh, just want to encourage you to be a part of that. But in order to do that, let's keep let's keep giving. So you can sign up online or you can text to give. There's so many different ways right after this, uh, after I'm gone from this, stay, stick with us for a little bit longer because we'll have some information at the end of this where you can kind of catch all of that, where you can text to, how you can give online and different things. Or if you want to drop it off, you're more than welcome to drop it off here at the church during the during the week. We're so honored that you're with us again this week. I want to I want to encourage you to join me next week, though. I'll be sharing a message uh, leading up to our Easter service, and I know you'll be blessed. It'll be a great time uh, to hear God's word. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the blood of Christ and uh, what it did for our life, and how it changed our life, and how it brought freedom into our life. And so, I encourage you to be a part of that. I pray today that you're blessed. I encourage you again, do not let the enemy steal your hope. Hope deferred, the Bible says, makes the heart sick. But when we have hope, our hope is in him. And so today I encourage you, stay in hope, stay in faith, stay believing, and let's see this thing come to an end. We'll be back together pretty soon. God bless you, Harvest Church. We'll see you next week.